So one of the things that really got me interested in the Missoula floods was as a geologist, when I was in college, I'd never heard of the Missoula floods. And the first time I'd heard of the Missoula floods was related to a site that we were working on in Hillsboro. And a geologist by the name of Russ Bunker, we were struggling with the hydrogeology and the stratigraphy. And you'll see a little bit of this associated with David's hand augering. You have not only the, the scale of the event, but you ha also have to think of geologic time and the concept of a million years, 10 million years, hundreds of millions of years, billions of years. The Missoula flood is a very recent event. It, is, it um, occurred between a period of approximately 13,000 to 15,000 years before the present. It originated in Missoula, Montana at the end of the li last uh, major ice age. Uh, a lobe of ice came down and blocked the Clark Fork River, which drained M the Missoula Basin. So a lake formed behind that ice dam that eventually reached a depth of approximately 2,500 feet and contained the volume of Lake Superior. This huge body of water, as the ice began to melt, created a, uh, a, a disequilibrium with that, that ice dam. And the, um, the belief is, within the scientific community, for the mechanism of the Missoula floods is that there was uh, the buoyancy of the height of the water caused the ice dam to uh, suddenly float, which created this uh, catastrophic uh, breaking of the dam. The glacial make Lake Missoula flooded down the uh, Clark Fork River into eastern Washington, into the Columbia River Basin, and scoured across eastern Washington into the Columbia River Gorge, filled up the Portland Basin with water, and then subsequently drained out to the Pacific Ocean. And in understanding the phenomenon, you have to realize that the landscape was different at the end of the Pleistocene here, not only in, um, uh, across the state, but here in Ridgefield. The floodplain that you see behind me didn't exist. That was the, the uh, base of the Columbia River was approximately 200 feet lower than it is today. And the canyon would have lo looked much more like the Columbia River Gorge does uh, currently. So when that huge volume of water came scouring across Eastern Washington, it was approximately it exceeded the volume of all of the rivers of the world combined. It was uh, traveling at a rate of approximately 60 to 80 miles an hour. It came through the Columbia River Gorge and it was at an elevation of approximately 500 feet. So there would have been essentially an aerosol of water coming out of the opening of the Columbia River Gorge that would have likely shot almost entirely across the Portland Basin. It had these huge entrance velocities. It was carrying rocks that were the sizes of the building behind me. And it was also carrying uh, pieces of ice, debris, mud. It stripped all of the soil off of uh, its path in Eastern Washington which was primarily the uh, Palouse loam, and came into the Portland Basin. When it entered the Portland Basin, these, this huge current of water, it began to diffuse. And it diffused across the Portland Basin. Again, the Columbia River was 200 feet lower than it is today, so it would have been a formidable river. And 
as the, this huge new volume of water came into the basin, it uh, encountered a constriction at Kalama. And this constriction is where the Columbia River began to encounter the coast range and bedrock formations. And so that kept the water from flowing out of the basin as quickly as it was entering it. As a result, there was a secondary lake formed. And this is something that I, I find fascinating because again, when you're thinking about geologic time, you're thinking about millions of, of years. This was occurring within the period of weeks. It took Glacial Lake Missoula approximately a week to drain. Subsequently, the filling of the Portland Basin behind the Kalamak constriction took about a week, and then that took about another week to drain after that. The height of the water above us at this location would have been approximately 300 feet deep, and it would have extended to uh, almost Eugene, and the depth of water over Corvallis would have been approximately 200 feet deep. Jim convinced me that the landscape around the Ridgefield area had been shaped by the Missoula floods, so I decided to test that theory by looking at the geologic map of the area to see whether there are um, geologic units that uh, have been mapped that um, are associated with the floods. And what I noticed is areas of sediment, or what we call quaternary alluvium, th that had been mapped in the upper headwaters of um, some drainages east of Ridgefield, which is unusual because the upper headwaters of drainages are typically erosional areas and not areas where sediments come to rest. So I suggested that we head out into the field and install some hand auger borings in one of these depressional areas where the alluvium had been mapped to see if those sediments resemble deposits that may have been deposited by the floods. So we headed out into the field to this depression and um, installed a hand auger boring to 16 feet and we encountered alternating layers of clay, silt, and sand, which we immediately recognized as rhythmites. The term rhythmite is um, used by geologists to describe packages of sediment that are deposited in an obvious repeating fashion with, with periodicity to it. Um, and in this case, the deposits were coarser grained at the bottom and finer grained at the top. Um, so when you have a mixture of sediments and you stir them all up and allow them to settle out in a water column, um, the coarsest and heaviest grains will settle out first and the finer grain will settle out later and so you end up with what geologists refer to as a fining upward sequence or a package of sediment that is coarser at the bottom and finer at the top. And these fining upward rhythmite deposits are uh, kind of the classic deposit associated with the Missoula floods. So for example, near Walla Walla, Washington, the Missoula floodwaters uh, dammed up behind what is referred to as the Wallula constriction and formed a large lake over and over again with each flood. And during each flooding event, those sediments would settle out and form a layer. And then the next flood event, that would happen again and again and again. And so in the canyons around the Wallula, or Walla Walla area, you see these uh, repeating layers of, of sediment. Closer to home in the Portland, Vancouver area, the floodwaters ponded behind the Kalama constriction, which is downstream of Ridgefield, and resulted in a lake that in inundated the entire Portland, Vancouver area. And those same rhythmite deposits have been observed, for example, at the um, excavations for the Oregon Convention Center. And then um, in the field, we observed the same deposits in, the, um, in this depression east of Ridgefield. And so it was uh, very exciting for us to have a theory about how the landscape east of Ridgefield uh, was shaped by the Missoula floods and to go out in the field and test that theory by um, augering into this depression and observing geologic units that match 
um, geologic units that are you know, representative of the flood deposits. In order to understand the hydraulics, what I suggest that people do is anywhere you are on this landscape uh, between Vancouver and Ridgefield, just imagine the height of the water at about the height of a utility pole or a tree, and then look at the topography around you and imagine what was happening at that moment. That will give you then the ability to understand something that happened in an instant of time and if we understand that it originated in Glacial Lake, Missoula, came all the way across the state of Washington, went through all this stuff to get to where we are on the surface that we're standing on, I think you'll have an understanding and appreciation for how amazing that was.